and hey, they want to read the, the, the end because they want to jump right to the end. They <laughs> hear the end of the story, you know. And they, they start reading at the beginning and then they find out there's a relationship and all this. They like to jump to the end and see what the end is. Uh, we're watching a movie. Maybe I've seen it before and the kids will come in and, and they'll they'll see it unfolding and they know there's something. And so they ask, hey, you know, what happens? What happens? No, I can tell you. Whoa. You know, or, or maybe it's the reverse. I come in, I see a movie and the kids have seen it before. And what, what? You don't want them to tell you then because, you know, it's the end. It's the whole story. Well, no, you might as well just, you know, go to bed because you know like, you, know, you know the ending. And so I, I just thought of it spiritually. Isn't it like God? You know, to put this book at the end. There's a reason that he put it at the end. And, and it's, the, what did we read last week? The very first phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if somebody wanted to just jump to the end and read what it's all about, what is it all about? It's a who. It's Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the central figure of the Bible, certainly, and it should be the central figure of our lives. We, what is life all about? Jesus Christ. Do you know him or don't you? To know him is to go to heaven. To not know him is to go to hell. And, and then when you know him, you, you want to follow him and hear what he says. And by his grace, he's going to help you live it. It's all about Jesus Christ. It should be. It should be. It should all be a, about Jesus Christ. People will say to you or me, you know, you're singing about Jesus all the time. You can't. You're always talking about Jesus. You know, why is that? Because that's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. I love the fact that that uh, the Revelation, the book of Revelation is that way. So an appreciation for the book and where it is in, in, in the Word of God. Now, now the title of the lesson is Let Them Hear, and it, we're going through chapters 2 and 3. And, and notice, let, let implies a choice. Let them hear. And so right off the bat, uh, be, I'll just talk about the first thoughts as we read. Uh, it, it had to do about hearing. And we, we should appreciate that we can hear. I think of Ed and Kathy Blair. Kathy had surgery on the ear and because she was struggling with hearing. And like a lot of things, you don't appreciate it until you lose it. And your, your eyes get you know, dim and you can't see as well and you've got to have glasses, reading glasses and then contacts and all that kind of stuff. You don't appreciate it until you, you lose it. Or you don't appreciate it until, until maybe there's something that's interfering with it. So when it comes to our hearing, you don't appreciate hearing like you should until you start to lose it. And then you will go to great depths, Kathy Belay, to restore your hearing. That, or you don't realize the value of hearing or how important it is when there's a lot of background noise and there's a lot of interference and there's a lot of things that are preventing you from hearing. Uh, I don't know about you, but you know what? Even Chad will have a little uh, upfront demonstration, and the message will be, "Hey, when pastor's preaching, let's try not to interrupt." Okay. And hey, bless your heart, if you've got a kid that stubbed his toe and he's screaming his eyeballs out, you know, hey, you know, we, you know, we all got kids, we all know that, but but maybe you want to usher them to the other building and tell Pastor, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I had four kids, same thing. But the whole idea, why do why do we want to be considerate of one another? The movie that took place on Wednesday, how many of you saw that? Raise your hand. Well, wasn't that great? Uh, very powerful. But but again, like Sunday morning, like that movie, you want people to hear and understand. So those that background noise, you know, that can be irritating to some people, you know. So we, we go to efforts to try to make sure that people can hear. Well, that, that, that's an example of spiritual truth. And we're going to read about it in a second here, where, where, where Jesus is challenging you and I to hear the spiritual truths that the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us. Okay. Well, here's the point. Let's tie them together. Sometimes we don't hear Sometimes, you and I now, we could talk about everybody else, but nobody else is here except us. Okay, so let's talk about us. Sometimes we do not hear. We have a hearing loss problem. Spiritually. And it's almost always one issue. Sin. Or, our hearing can be hindered. The background noise. The noise of our culture, our world, the author refers to it. The influence of the world. Boy, doesn't First John, that study, tie into Revelation, where God says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And God says we are to love him. 
and love him with all our heart. And God warns us that our love can be sucked up by the world. And now it's the same kind of thought where the influence of the world, which is people at work, people in the neighborhood, people in your family, people in your relationships, and, and our attention gets on those things, and we get, we get sidetracked. The Bible says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? It's always someone. And maybe, maybe it's not you this week, but maybe it's your children. So as parents or grandparents, somebody hinders them, and they're not hearing what the Spirit has to say. And again, it's sin. This author is very articulate and very very professional in the way that he, he writes. And he, but but I, I speak more plainly. You know, the background noise of our culture, that's the sinfulness of our world. So that affects our hearing. Our own sin, and, and we don't hear what the Spirit's saying, or the sinfulness and the widespread influence of it, where, where even Christians now think, well, you know what, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, if a man wants to marry a man, I mean, as long as they love one another, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. They're influenced by the world. They think because a bunch of Supreme Court judges pass a law, well, then maybe, maybe there's something to it, and they've forgotten what the Word of God says about the matter. Amen. So that's just one of a thousand examples that comes to my mind. So, so uh, while we'll go through the message today, t I couldn't help but see that there's a, there's a bigger message that I just tried to articulate, that be wary of the world creating that background noise. Do not take for granted your own sinfulness. Anytime that you can say to yourself, well, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, but, well, at least I'm not... Whatever you know is sin. There is no acceptable will of God. You're either in his will or you're not. So whatever that is, that's going to affect your hearing of the word of God. Deal, I just urge you to deal with that sin, confess that sin, forsake that sin, and restore that hearing. Because like the author said, a person can be in a place where the word of God is preached or taught. And you can be there at the time and in the place and still not hear How's that possible? What I just tried to explain. So, so that's kind of a, a message that we're going to see. And now we're going to look at you know, the specific material in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. But, but boy, there's a bigger message there that I just tried to introduce. So with that as an introduction, let's read the scripture on page 81. Uh, and, and this particular lesson, the author is, is taking... Uh, how many of you are aware of the seven churches in chapter 2 and 3? Okay, so, so we know there's that specific uh, message directed to the historical seven churches, which you have a map on the back of your guidebook, and, and each one of the churches has a special little church-like little building. And, and it was a literal congregation, a literal physical uh, group of born-again Bible believers just like us that were gathering. And this, this letter, these messages, these letters from God through John to bring to those churches. Yes, yes. Uh, but there's many other applications which we'll just, talk about a couple recently, of weeks. Just recently, I don't know if anybody's been listening to the news much, but the state of Oklahoma, the Supreme Court, has ordered, they have the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court, in the judge, to, to the court system, in Oklahoma court system. They have been ordered by law to remove the Ten Commandments out of the court system. And this is this is one I believe is one of the end of the sign, uh, end times are coming. Understood. And hence the importance we see the world around us. We see there's one more of a thousand examples of how the world influencing things. So so we so so then we what we have to make sure is we're confessing our sin. We have to make sure that we're loving not loving the world and we're not letting any of this uh, influence us. Why? And our focus is going to be on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said. Where are you going to find that? In the Bible. You know, where are you going to learn about that? In this, in this church. So great that you're coming to church. Great, great, great. But you want to have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. And so the importance of confessing sin. And, and especially after you've been. How many have been in the world for the last week? <laughs> All of us. OK. 
Hey, so, so glory to God. I'm so glad that we I can come Sunday morning and then I can go over to the South Campus on Sunday night and get another helping. How many of you eat like three times a day? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. So all you, all I'm doing is coming to church three times a week, and Pastor will tell you, you know, I'm gonna come whenever Pastor's preaching or teaching. And that's that's three. Okay, that, but that's only three. You better not rest on that. You better be in, get your nose in that book like every day. You eat three times a week. You can at least open up the book, you know, once a day, maybe in the beginning before you go to work and read a chapter or two. You can at least do that. Feed your spirit once a day. I'm spider webbing. Let's go back to the message, okay? So it says on page 81, let's read. It says we're reading selected verses out of these messages to the seven churches. Let's read. So verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of of the paradise of God. Verse 11. He that hath an ear to hear, let him, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a, a, a new name written which no man knoweth, saying, saving he that receiveth it. Verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Verse 28, And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now we jump to chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Okay, so, so first thoughts, I've already talked about the first thoughts, the appreciating the ability to hear, not only physically, talk to Kathy Blair. Okay, uh, but then spiritually, we've already addressed that. The things that interfere, it's, it, it's sin. So, again, a re another reminder to not take sin lightly. Another reminder to not have the attitude, well, I know I shouldn't be doing this. <coughs> I shouldn't be doing this, but, you know what I mean? I would, whatever it is, Spirit of God, convict you, convict me. Let's deal with that thing and get it under the blood and have victory over it. Because that, that affects not only your prayer life, but it affects your hearing, okay? Like so many of you are doing. And, and it's such a blessing to, to see uh, God working in your life and, and seeing, I don't know if there's anything sweeter that I enjoy than, than the, to, to understand and see. And some of the deacons are way, way better at it than I am. But, but they'll see the blessings in somebody's life. Because of their obedience. Boy, that is just wonderful to see. How many of you, I mean, how many of you understand that when someone goes forward to be baptized, that that's an act of obedience to God? How many of you understand that? You know, so, so you could sit there, well, it's not me, you know, you know, and you look at what they're wearing, you know, and you look at their hair when they come up out of the water, and you call that foolishness. But, but don't, don't miss, don't miss the act of obedience. And be thankful to God thankful to God and maybe even whisper up a prayer for her or a prayer for him God by your mercy help that person out to walk in obedience that, that, that he or she might have the, the blessings of almighty God because of their obedience okay so that, that's huge alright so we talked about the first thoughts now understanding the context the context again the historical context there were seven churches local congregations Let's, let's, I mentioned them in my bonus material sheet. Again, we're in Sunday school, so if you don't know them, at least let's introduce them. <coughs> Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, Pergamos. Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Okay. And, and here's what I did. Because, you know, the, how many have ever heard me say every dead frog must wiggle? Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so, so I say that a million times. Because every dead frog must wiggle is a, a memory mnemonic or whatever the word is, and, and each letter stands for it, you know, something. The five functions of the church, evangelism, discipleship, so every dead frog must wiggle. So I tried to come up with something like that. And so I wrote down, so I ended up with ESP, teaspoon, Leo. <laughs> You know, and, and that works for me. ESP, ESPN, sports, okay, ESP. You know, or then, you know, or you have ESP. Right, so I, I can't remember it that way. So you want it to be silly so that you remember it, okay? So if this works for you, go ahead and teaspoon, you know. Is that how you use teaspoon? Teaspoon? Yeah. Okay, good, good. So, 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 emphasis, you know, and then I, and then I did ES per, ES per, because that, because there's, there, there was two P's. So, so now, and I know what the first one's Ephesus and then Smyrna, so I had that down. So, but ESP, teaspoon, and then I, I was going to do lazy, loser, you know, but then I just did lao because that's lao just the, you know, so anyway. So if, you, if that works for you, you know, it, you, could, you could learn the seven churches. Some of you might go to Hollywood and play on Jeopardy and you might win a million dollars, daily double. Okay, so, so, so those are the seven churches. They were literal, physical churches. But now let's, we could read it historically, great. But there's at least two ways, in addition, to read about these seven churches. And I'm just introducing them because we don't have time to go into it in much depth. But the first way to look at these seven churches are that, that each one of those seven churches is an example of, of any church. So I've heard it taught where these seven churches really... One or more of them apply to every single church on planet Earth. How many of you understand what I said? Okay. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. The second, second may, way that it's been taught is that the, the seven churches also, in addition to the literal, physical, historical, local congregations, it can represent each church and the way that they're laid out in that order represents one of seven church ages. How many have ever heard that before? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Only one. Okay, okay. So I'm just going to introduce this idea. Again, uh, I've heard it that way. I was taught that way. Pastor Jim preached a series in that way. Where then, for example, if, if you look at, and Pastor Jim preached this, but I've heard others, where Ephesus was a summary, God's commentary, on the, the first century or two, or whatever it was. But the first, and then, and, then, and then as you work, that's why, how many have ever heard this, that we are living in the, the Laodicean church age? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. When you, when, when, when you hear that, we're living in the Laodicean age, it's a reference to what I'm trying to introduce you. Because the last church is Laodicea. And that's the one characterized by lukewarmness. Remember? Anybody remember that? And God spewed them? Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, one after another, this is commentary on the various church ages, which are what? It's the response of the church, the universal church of Jesus Christ, which began in the New Testament. Jesus. You don't, you, I don't even think the word church is in the Old Testament. Jack? I don't think it's in the Old Testament, is it? Uh, okay. okay, so the church was ordained and instituted by the coming of Jesus Christ. And the day of Pentecost, and that. So, so, so these seven church ages represent the response of the church from the time that Jesus came until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's the response of the church of Jesus Christ to the mission that God has called it to over the last 2,000 years now. How many of you understand what I just said? Yep. Okay, that, that's a good introduction. So, so I have that summarized under the context section, number two. Uh, one approach to interpreting the book of Revelation understands the seven churches, there they are. Uh, to represent not only all types of churches, that's number one, but also seven distinct stages of church history, i.e. the progression of the church's response to its mission in the world from the first century until the return of Christ. That's a nice, maybe fundamental 
of understanding the book. Hey, Jim. There's a couple yes, of things that you said. I don't know if you're not familiar with it. I'm just, I've just been reading a couple of books. I mean, you know, in Ephesians it says the lack of Ephesus, the lack of judgment of false prophets. That's the first church. Second church is Samaria, fearful. Uh, Persian or whatever, it becomes worldly, embracing in false doctrines. By whatever, I was never how to pronounce it, pronounce. Follow the teaching of Jezebel. Follow the teaching of Jezebel. So there he is a deadly or orthodox. The fellow church is warning to be faithful or loose their rewards, or lose their rewards. And then you go into the media because it's lukewarm. Understood. Now, here, here's my suggestion. You know, I'm not the pastor, but I, I you know, I, I do claim to love you. <laughs> okay. And God's helped me to try to do that. Here's what I suggest. You're always going to pray, read through the scripture. But if you wanted to go into more depth of what I just introduced, if I was you, I would listen to Pastor Jim's series. He is your pastor. He is the man that God has laid on his heart, a word to preach that series. And if you were my children, my daughters, I'd be very leery about what information you are reading because it can go all over the place. And you can, introduce, you can get introduced to all kinds of words and thoughts and everything. And just out of caring for, for my family and for my brothers and sisters, I, I, would start, I would start with prayer, reading the scripture, and I would listen to what my pastor preached on it. That would be a really solid foundation. Now that's just my opinion for what it's worth. Because God is not the author of confusion. And so uh, there, there's a lot of deep symbolic stuff in the book of Revelation. And if you've never done studies like that, I would start there. I, I would say, this is the man that God has over me. This is the man that God filled, filled his heart with messages to preach this kind of stuff. I would start there. That's what, that's what I would do. And, and that's why I talked to Ginger. And I want to I make sure that series is out there. Because I understand in all of us there's a de desire to go deeper into the Word of God, you know. But I've met people in my Christian walk that that, I, and that what I say around the house, man, they got off the deep end on this stuff. And, and so you got to be careful. You want to believe all of the book. You want to follow all of the book, and, and not get too off the deep end on one particular thing. So a good start would be praying, going through this reading the book like Kathy is, and then if you want to go deeper, I would listen to what Pastor Jim preached on it. Because you're a member of this church, he's your pastor, and that would prevent you from maybe being confused and going, getting introduced with all kinds of other interpretations of it. How many of you understand what I'm trying to say? Okay, okay good, good, so let's let's move on. So, so, so then, uh, let, let's look at a couple of the basics that, that we saw in our verses. Uh, I'm on page 84. We're exploring the text. And, and what the author did, which I thought was pretty cool at first, I didn't see it at first, but here, here's the idea. Usually when I read chapter 2 and 3, I see this pattern. And the author mentioned this pattern. As, as the letter to each individual church, there's the pattern. Like here, Here's what's included in each one. A, a comment about the author, which is Jesus Christ. You know, the Alpha and the Omega, you know, the one stand with the can seven candles. That, uh, number two, it's some encouraging words about the church, some words of praise. Number three, God has an issue or two with that church. He's got a problem. Okay. And then, and then number four, there's some kind of command or exhortation of, of what to do. You know, generally it's repent, you know. Uh, so, so you're going to see that as you read each letter. Anybody else see something more than those four items in that pattern? How many of you? How many of you read the Book of Revelation before? 
Okay, how many of you kind of read it that way, like I described? You, you get to the, to the church at Ephesus, and you read, and you see some comment about the Lord Jesus, some, some words of praise. You know, you suffered long through some suffering, which they did, of course, in the first church age. They were thrown up to lions, and so on. Okay, and, and, but then God had a problem with an issue, right? And then finally at the end, I, I, I exhort you, you know, therefore, to repent, you know, and I exhort you to take some action. How, how many of you have read it that way? I know I did. Okay, good, Jack. Me and, me and you, Jack. Okay, so, so, and that's okay to read it that way. That's okay. But, 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 but what the author did was he looked at all seven letters and he said, you know what, in each one, God makes a promise. Let's look at those promises. Oh, oh that's pretty cool. Now let's collectively look at all seven promises. I like that. And then the second half of the lesson is, you know, God said some things about how, the, how we're going to rule and reign with him, and he summarized all of those. I've never done that. I like that. So, so, so now you kind of see the framework in which we're going through this lesson, this particular study of the seven churches. So you're going to see that. But in every one of them, a couple of the basics, how many, we read, he that hath an ear to hear. Okay, so what does that mean? That, that is a very beautiful, poetic, Holy Spirit, the best author in the world, saying that he that hath the ear, it, it, it's an emphasis that, hey, Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, is speaking. So, our response should be to listen faith and be obedient that's it and now I'm adding to that he that hath an ear let him hear let you can choose you can choose not only this of course but throughout scripture you can choose to do what to read it in faith and have a desire in your heart that whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. So, so, so with those comments, I've addressed every phrase. You know, he that hath a ear, let him hear. And, and notice what the Spirit saith to the churches. We talked about this last week. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, is speaking to the churches, which are made up of born-again Bible believers. This is a very personal book. From a loving God to all of us. Well, you know, so how come, uh, how, and I hate to pick on Oprah Winfrey, she's the only one I know, but, you know, how come Oprah Winfrey doesn't, you know, well, she's lost as a goose. It's not written to her. Okay, so, so the, the second point is this. Uh, you'll see many times it says, to him that overcometh. To him that overcome, to him that overcome. I want to make sure, God wants to make sure that we know who that is. And that is anyone that is saved. That is anyone that is born again. Later on in the book of Revelation, there, there's, there's a reference that, that we, we overcame the devil, the evil one. By the blood of the Lamb and the spirit of you know, prophecy, something like that. I think I have a Bible verse. Yes, I do. On the, on, uh, under, under number three, uh, Roman numeral number two there, two there, the Bible says, for, what's, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How many of you realize you're the whatsoever? How many of you are born again? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Okay, so, so you're the whatsoever. So, so it says, it says, the Bible says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, not only did it make you born again, not only did it make you saved, not only did you have a conversion, but another word in the word of God that refers to that experience, not only, you know, the saving moment in time, but the ongoing sanctification, you're an overcomer. You watch the Packer game, you know, and they're down by they're, they're down by a touchdown, and so the, now at the end they end up winning the game. And so the sports guy will say the Packers overcame the 10-point halftime deficit. So 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 it it implies a victory. 
And there's even that song, all glorious victory that overcome the world. And what's the name of that song? Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Faith. Okay, so, so an overcomer, he that overcometh, that's you and me. That's people that are saved. How many of you understand that? Raise your hand. Okay, okay. Comment. I, Let me see if I understand what you're saying. There, there's, there's, there's two components to this overcoming. There's the salvation, we're overcome the world and we're going to heaven. But then there's this living in victory, living in faith, walking in the spirit in a lifetime that is characterized by obedience and blessings of God and we've overcome the world, right? Am I saying that right? Okay, got it, got it. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Did, you, did everybody hear that? You know, there's the overcoming when you get saved, but then God expects us to walk by faith, and God gives us the Spirit. God gives us everything we need to walk in faith and overcome anything and everything that the world or the devil throws at us. We can live in victory. I like that. Okay, Ed. Amen. Amen. Anybody remember last week I was talking about hearing, reading, hearing, and, and keeping? Doers of the word. Remember that last week? Anybody? Okay, good. Good, good, good. good. Don't want to be spit out. Our church doesn't want to be spit yeah, yeah. yeah. Have God spit us out because we are Because we're lukewarm. I always think back to coffee. I, I, like, I either like it iced or I like it steaming hot, just about. You know, I touch my lip. Ow, okay, it's perfect. It's hot. I like it hot or I like it ice cold. Luke, lukewarm, I, I throw it out. Did anybody else throw out lukewarm coffee? You, hey, you make a cup at work. You better drink it in the first five minutes or that, that thing is enough to make you throw up. Throw it out. And I thought, it's just like that. Okay, so 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 we kind of went off a little bit, but that's a good place to go. All right, so, so now let's read, let's read quickly the, 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 the verses. On page 84, we're reading verse 7. And, and I'm going to emphasize, you know, each one is, is one of the promises of God. All right. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the tr you get to eat of the tree of life. Remember back in the book of Genesis? How many remember mentioned, has anyone ever recall reading about the tree of life in Scripture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember in the Garden of Eden, you know, they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, and, and then they disobeyed. And then what God say? You know, let's let's get them out of here, be, lest they take of the tree of life and live forever. Go to the next verse, page 85, verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. How many have ever read about the second death? Somebody, somebody, tell me what the second death is. Hell, yeah. Uh, remember Revelation uh, 21, 8? But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and liars and whoremongers and, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with, with uh, fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He's talking okay. about the white throne judgment. He's talking about the white throne judgment. Well, that's at the white throne judgment is where they get thrown in. Uh, yeah, we're not going to be there. We're not going to be there at no, the white we throne. we won't be there, but there'll Good. be a lot of other lambs. Bob was about... I've been praying about my parents. I've been praying about a lot of people myself that they may not be there. I had a, a dream years ago, and see, this is just a dream. The funny thing is, but that woke me up. I was standing in, in the midst of a, night, a glimpse far away, and I seen where all these people were standing, and there was a lake of fire where the key was unlocked. Smoke arose from it from the lake of fire. As there was a tunnel that was going right down in there, but there was no way for it to come back. It was going in, it was wide, then it ended up narrow. And all these people were going in, and I said, Lord, not me. That ain't gonna be the place for me. Amen, amen. And that's where your book, and in the book, in the book of Revelation says, anyone that gets to Lord today as in the kingdom of God, that name has to be in the last book of life. Amen, amen. 
All right, we got to keep moving, Jeff. Okay, right. bless your heart. Okay, because we're running out of time. But it says on uh, the next verse, uh, uh, Revelation three five: He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. How many have ever heard of the book of life? Yep. Good, good. You want your name in there, okay? And I know we don't have time to go there. We don't have time to go there, Jeff. We don't have time to go there. But but God promises that He will not blot out your name out of the book of life. Why would He go to the trouble to say that? Because something can happen where you can get blotted out. Uh, that's for the next class. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, but I uh, but I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. So you and I are saved. We don't have to worry about the second death. If you and I are saved in this age, and you and I are Gentiles, we don't have to ever, ever, ever worry about our name being blotted out of the book of life. Cannot happen. That's what we just read. Move on to the next one. All right, so verse 87, uh, page 87, verse 12 there. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. You, you just got to go back and read that. I'm going way too fast. But but let's go to the next one. <laughs> so so on page 88, uh, chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, he, he went back. Now we're going to take a glance at the purpose. So there were, there were a bunch of promises, okay, and I have them in the notes, and then there, God is, is emphasizing that we're going to be a part of his rule and reign. How many have ever heard that before? All right, good, good, good. Okay, so I'm going to go fast because you've heard it, but let's read it. It says in verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Who's him? You, me. And he shall rule, rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Let's go to the next one, verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus. Okay, and, and, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says on it. In other words, Jesus is given himself to reign as the king. Next verse, uh, last one, verse 21 there. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So it's like this. God's going to reign, and God's going to allow us to reign with him in, his, in, the, new, in the new kingdom. The New Jerusalem, all that kind of stuff. And then it's almost like, you know, hey, hey, Dad. Yeah. Hey, can I go sit on your throne? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you remember, remember I used to bring the kids to work, and, and, and we had all those burden carriers and those tailor guns and all that kind of stuff, and I'd work on a Saturday. I'd bring the kids. You know what they love? The reason they came after the first time was they wanted to ride on those tailor guns. And so I'd sit in there, and then once in a while, don't tell anybody, okay, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but once in a while, I'd let them steer. You know, oh, that was such a thrill. It was such a thrill. The kids would sit on there and literally drive a Taylor Dunn, you know, and go, go outside and go, oh, you know. Or, or how many of you ever take the kids boating? Anybody take the kids boating? Do you ever let the kids steer? Yeah, because after a while, it's cool, you know, the wind and everything. But after a while, they see Dad back there, oh, oh, oh. Guess what they want to do? They want to sit back there, oh, oh, oh. So very, very carefully, you know, very, very carefully. Okay, there you go. Oh, 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 you know, they feel the so, so the idea that a loving father is going to want the kids, you know, sit on his throne once in a while. All right, I'll get out of there. i got to run everything. Okay, so so the, here's, here's how I summed it up. Taken together, these promises, this, this was the message. You can look at, at the promises, both the, 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 the manna, the hidden manna, the white raiment. You know, your name's written in a pillar. Your name is written in a pillar in the temple of God. And he's writing your name and his name and all these names. Here's the message I got. Taken together, these promises indicate the absolute certainty and permanence of the believers standing before God. Do you realize if God goes to the trouble to give you all this stuff, if God goes to the trouble to write your name down on a pillar in the temple, guess what? You are going there. The absolute certainty and the permanence, the fact that it's it's written in a pillar up there. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. And, and and I'll take it back to Ida's comment earlier. Those churches were suffering. They were getting thrown to the lions. You and I, we ought to, we ought to guard our minds. We may have to suffer. I don't think any of us is suffering to the extent like some Christians over there in the Middle East and so on. But to some degree, we're starting to see it. Losing our rights, people mocking us, whatever. But this, this book of Revelation, don't miss it. The emphasis of the certainty of 
your eternity ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Let that be an encouragement, an encouragement to your heart so that you can endure. Yes? We have to remember, though, they're not mocking us. They're mocking who we believe in. Right, right, right. So we can't take it so personal. It's a spiritual warfare. Oh. They're not mocking us. Right, uh, good point. How many of you understand that? Raise your hand. Okay, but here's what I see in the world. How many of you are Packer fans? Okay, all right, okay, okay. You know, hey, they're mocking Aaron Rodgers. I don't take it personally. Yeah, and I, I don't see it at work. You mock the Packers to some people, and, and, and they got to call the cops, and they haul you out of Lambeau Field. So, so easier said than done is what I'm saying. And, and you know what? I'm okay if somebody has a problem with people knocking my Lord and Savior. I'm okay with that. And everybody understands. You start knocking Aaron Rodgers, you start knocking Jordy Nelson, all that kind of stuff, and they, and, and they have a problem with that because they are devoted fans. And I'll challenge you to be so devoted to Jesus Christ. There's some things they better not, somebody better not say that about my wife. Or, or they're going to have a fistful of knuckles. How much more, how much more if somebody's mocking our God? Hold on a minute. i got a problem with that. Hold on. I've done that. And it gets quiet. <laughs> and I walk away. Nothing wrong with that. So, so you can arm yourselves if you like. Hey, they're just mocking my Savior. You know, it's not personal. Wait a minute. Yes, it is personal. They're mocking my Lord and Savior, and I don't like it. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God and for the example, again, of the great love that you have for us, that you would let us know what's coming, and that we can watch for it and be encouraged by it. Even amidst all the suffering, we can have this hope that what God has said surely is true, is true as the chair we're sitting on. And let that be an encouragement and a comfort to us, God, that we would be moved to tell others, like Jeff said, that we would be moved to, to take a stand for you. Because it's an offense. Like David said, is there not a cause? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would defile the armies of the living God? Help us to be that kind of Christian. I pray this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you all for being here. Yeah, praise the Lord.